Welcome, guys. Um, we are going to let some people join the stream. Uh, in the meantime, each of us can introduce ourselves. I know we know each other, but um, our listeners may not. So I'm Nikki Barron. I'm the founder of Kitten Teeth, and I am a marketing and business coach for artists, specifically musicians. Um, so I help people turn their music projects into small businesses, um, launch, product, launch pro projects um, like albums, uh, things like that, help with marketing automation. And uh, I wanted to start this interview series because I get a lot of questions um, that I'm not an expert in and I don't know the answer to. So I find myself tapping all my friends and community being like, how do I, you know, set my client up for this or, you know, these different things. So that's where this comes in because one of the biggest questions I get is um, music is about collaboration. So how do I go about collaborating from my house and my bands in another house? Or if I, we're working on a record, how do we do that? Um, so that's what made me interested in you guys. Uh, Brad, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, hey everybody, I'm Bradley Lena. Um, I have been in a band called Vaudeville Etiquette for God, it's, been, it's close to eight to 10 years, something like that. And um, yeah, we, we uh, released a few records, uh, toured Europe a couple times and parts of the US. Uh, and then I also got into uh, recording. So I'm a recording engineer and a producer. Um, and I've worked with Nikki uh, with, with uh, artists and bands before. And um, yeah, I, I also, uh, we just started a, a new side project called Couch Cats, which is with uh, our other guest, Will, who will be coming up <laughs> after myself. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting time in a lot of ways. I mean, it's a very difficult time, obviously, but um, for the way that the landscapes change, it's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting time. So yeah, we're, we're, we're happy to be here and thanks for having us. Cool. Will, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right. Um, I'm William Mapp. I'm a drummer from Seattle. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> um, I, I spent last probably uh, six or seven years um, playing with a singer songwriter named Courtney Marie Andrews um, along with like a huge host of other Seattle bands. Um, Whitney Manger, General Mojo's Lowlands, The Cosmic Shuffle, um, just to name a few, plus all sorts of jazz and wedding gigs and um, so this like you know, my life was performing and obviously that doesn't happen anymore. So this has been a big, steep learning curve for me of how to continue to make music um, while being separated from everybody. Yeah, so that's, um, it's been really tough. Most people I know are making the majority of their income as artists from actually live performance, because as we know, like streaming pays like nothing people hardly ever buy digital downloads anymore or physical CDs. Everything is done through streaming services. So um, for you has, Will, has like your entire, like just income stream just was like, boop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are you doing yeah, any, just... any like besides couch cats, like are you doing like drums virtually for people or writing virtually or? Yeah. So I've been kind of, just learning how to record myself. Like I, I have enough gear to kind of mess around with. And it just, I just started kind of posting videos of myself, putting up different grooves on Instagram and a um, bunch of people were like, oh yeah, let me use this one. And so I've gotten some stuff back and forth from that. Um, but as far as income, mostly that is just gone. <laughs> Yeah. So I've been, I'm lucky enough to that I was able to get unemployment through the federal government and um, everything else has kind of just been kind of figuring out how to do this in a way that I feel comfortable charging people money for, which right now I'm kind of still learning. So I'm not sure that I like, yeah, feel like I can do like pr professionally record from my garage. Yeah. Um, and Brad, you are in a band, but you are also an audio engineer. Has work basically stopped for you, or are you still uh, recording some people? Like, kind of, what are you, what are you doing? Um, I'm in a unique position only because 
you know, a lot of what I do, audio engineering and some producing can be done remotely and has been in the past. I know a lot of engineers that already were doing remote mixing of, of audio and records and things like that. So while my work has slowed down significantly because people just aren't moving forward with projects, a lot of things are on hold. Um, I had a lot of projects that were kind of in the pipeline already, so I've continued to sort of keep working on those. Um, but overall, I mean, I was also a gigging musician, so that completely disappeared, like Will said. I mean, it, it's just gone. And, um, uh, you know, beyond that, a lot of the other things that I do, like commercial music production and, and film music, that's all on hold, primarily, for the most part. So. Yeah, it definitely slowed things down and I started to kind of look at, as I think a lot of us have, we, we, we start to, to look around and say, well, how are we gonna move forward with this now that we've all gotta um, be careful and, and stay in and you know do all the things we're doing. Yeah, so is that sort of where the inspiration of Couch, Couch Cats came from? Like where, you guys play together in some bands, but you aren't, I don't know, I guess maybe I'm, I am out of the loop, but. Couch Cat seems to be like the, like your projects together, right? Like that's, this is the first project of like you and Will started together or, or were you guys already playing in another yeah. band or? I um, guess we, go ahead, Will. Oh, I was going to say, I guess we kind of like have, I don't think we regularly play in any bands together, although we have played together a decent We've amount. jammed. We've, We've jammed, jammed We've jammed. Yeah, or like, you know. <laughs> and like Brad, Brad's played with the Cosmic Shuffle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I played with Vaudeville Etiquette. Um, so we had like a crossover. Yeah, we had like a, a, a short, short-lived like super group called Lazy Incorporated. <laughs> I remember that. Which, yeah, was it like, Adam, like two was Adam Williams in that? Yeah, yeah Adam Williams, June Butler. Um, <laughs> what a super uh, group! Tes Matt Teske from Vaudeville, and then we had a bunch of special guests. Yeah. And um, yeah, so as far as Couch Cats goes. This is our first thing that we've kind of gone, hey, let's let's do something collaboratively and, and try to push it forward. And really it was, for me, it was inspired by Will's drum beats. He was already posting, he was, he was putting up drum beats, just random drum loops and things like he was saying, just putting them out there and saying, hey, if you wanna pick this up, if you wanna use this, whatever. So I grabbed a couple of them and, and just pieced them together into these like funky jazz tunes and, um, I myself am a big fan of, of like uh, John Schofield, the guitar player, his work and uh, Medeski Martin and Wood and kind of weird. It's, it's, it's sort of like, I don't know what you would call it, fusion acid jazz or something. Um, yeah. Acid jazz. And, and so, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not everybody's cup of tea, <laughs> but, but it, um, it's very fun to, to make and to play and, and Will's an incredible drummer. So um, I just sent him some stuff and was like, Hey man, like, maybe we should make this into a thing where we can have, have special guests come in and collaborate and we'll kind of like build it. We'll be the foundation and we'll, we'll invite people in and we'll put it out and see what happens. Yeah, that's super great. So you guys are kind of building um, a band while you're also learning to work remotely together. So you don't have like a legacy of writing music together. It's um, no. all brand new. I mm -hmm. think that, yeah, I think that's interesting because it feels like that would be harder if you're not in the same room, like looking at each other in the eyes and like sort of like seeing what's going on. Um, do you think that that's the case? Like, is it a little harder to write this way or are you guys just like picking it up fine? Or have you had any like, you know, things that you're like, oh, this is very different than working with someone I know. Um, I mean, I, I guess I think the hardest part is that there's not the kind of immediate feedback like, I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Brad, but I have like, when yeah. something comes, there's like a thousand different ideas. And I'm like, well, I could do this, or I could do this, or I could do this. And usually it's good to sit down with people in a room and start playing something. And immediately you can tell it's like, oh, that one doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Um, yeah. So like learning to be your own filter is really hard. Um, <laughs> so you guys aren't like on Zoom or like on FaceTime, like, in real time being like, what do you think of this? It's all like, I record a finished piece and send it. Is that kind of how it goes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what, what I've enjoyed about it is at least at this point, we might get a little more intricate with it, but 
what we're doing with it at this point is it's very immediate. It's very like, um, I'm just taking what Will's putting out and I'm not really like judging any of it too harshly. I'm just going, this sounds good. I'm going to do that and, and I'll put that in there and this. And then if somebody, we've had a couple of people already um, contribute some parts and like, we're not really giving them much direction. It's just like, just do what you think works over it. And then, you know, we're, we're able to take it and, and I've sort of been doing the, the post-production, the mixing and arrangement, and then we'll, we'll, we'll offer suggestions and be like, oh, well, maybe I should redo that drum part or da-da-da. So okay. we'll do some things like that. But the beauty of it, at least from my perspective, is, is there's an immediacy and a, a rawness to it. Like we're keeping the mistakes. We're keeping the, the shit. You know what I mean? Just because like sometimes that's what makes cool music. Right. Um, so I like not being too meticulous about it. Yeah. So do you think that's, that's a pretty good benefit of like, at some point you just have to learn to like, let some stuff go. Like it's because yeah. you're not in the studio facing each other. You're not right there, like collaborating in real time. So like at some point you have to just be more like, leave it to the universe, I guess. Um, yeah. And like, yeah, just like Will said, learn to be your own filter, like decide what you like and just pursue it, you know, and go and, and commit to it or be open to being like, oh, right here. Now that everyone else's parts are changed, I can change mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's really an interesting thing. It's, I know songwriting can be very like, you know, especially in a group setting can be just challenging on its own. Right. So it's almost like these boundaries might make it a little bit simpler, Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like that situation where like, if you can do anything, you'll, most people just end up doing nothing or just feeling, you know, but making it a box to create in, you know, might make it a little bit like a cool challenge. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like there's a certain amount of freedom with it in that way, which, you know, is, and I, I know, I'm sure Will, you've, you've also faced this as well. Like, like Nikki's saying, when, you, when you're in a collective and you're really trying to make something like really pristine and perfect, it's a beautiful thing and, and you're, you really do end up with a, uh, an incredible end result that way because everybody's really getting in there with, you know, the fine tooth comb and really picking everything apart. So it's perfect, which, which is great in its own right. But um, yeah, I sort of, I, I like, this is one of the first projects publicly that I've been involved with. That's more just like, yeah, that's cool. Let's just put it out there. And just, that sounds yeah. great. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So um, on the flip side of that, what would you say is like the hardest part about collaborating this way? Um, I think for me, for me, it's, it's, I, I often am like my own worst critic and a pretty deep perfectionist. So is that can be the hardest part is when, you know, we, we get something and, and I'm like, well, let me try and redo the drums here. And then two days later, I still haven't gotten something that I like because I'm just like, ah, no, that doesn't work. And that doesn't work. And that doesn't work. I can, I can do it better. And, and so like for me really learning to like put something down and commit to it and just be like, that's what it is. And it's going to be great. Yeah. Has been yeah. Really hard. So it's, it's almost like it's a pro and a con, like it's mm-hmm. learning and stretching that muscle of like just putting it down and like being confident in what you did, but also that's like ah, nerve wracking and horrible because <laughs> mm-hmm. you're a professional mm-hmm. yeah. and you're used to being in a situation where the person you're working with is going, yep, that's the one I want. And yeah. in this case, you got to be the person to go, yep, that's the one I want. Yeah. That's, I never have appreciated a producer more than now. <laughs> Just like having somebody being like, that was great. Stop, be done. Is <laughs> yeah. like the most important. Like I had no idea how important that was until there's that voice isn't here anymore yeah what a skill yeah i uh my first time ever like being a part of that process and even in a small way was working with brad on the drifter luke's record um it was so weird because it's like you're telling somebody who's making it it's perfect or it needs to be done again or changed and maybe you don't have like the language for that so like coming from that perspective that was my first time to ever be like how do i explain that I want this to be different or that it's perfect. And they're arguing with me that it's not perfect. And I'm mm-hmm. going like, it's perfect. Um, yeah. That's weird. Yeah, that was, that was a fun, that's an amazing record, by the way, everybody yeah. check out the drifter Luke, his <laughs> record, uh, uh, part one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's an incredible, we, we made an EP and it's, it's so good. His songs are so good and his singing is amazing. And, um, 
it was funny because on that project in particular, I was more of the perfectionist. Like I really wanted it to be, you know, perfect, but also raw in a way. Like I wanted to capture his, his raw self and what he does, but then kind of, you know, make it very, you know, pretty, pretty high production on it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it all depends on, on who you're working with and what the goal of the project is. But like on that one in particular, I was more of the perfectionist. And yeah. then at times I just like, as a producer, sometimes you just, all you need to do is, is let the person come to those realizations. You kind of guide the person to come to the realization that it is what they want, if it is yeah. in fact. So you kind of let them produce themselves in a way. It sounds weird, but you sort of, yeah. you sort of, they're like, what do you think of that? And you go, well, do you like it? You know? <laughs> there you go will now just, just ask yourself what do you think of yeah. that and then yeah, yeah. I just need... oh, well do yeah. you like it because and then really... if you go i do well then yeah, you start getting end, really it's weird about you and it's about you know like you know the answer of whether you like it or not and that's really all that matters in my opinion sometimes it's like do you like it because mm -hmm. that's really what it comes down to because you can't control if anybody else likes it or not you know totally um, so, so what about yeah. for you, Brad? What's been the most difficult thing about um, working remotely? Um, I think that the, it's, it's funny because while I was saying that it has a more immediate feel in a lot of ways, just the approach, um, the immediacy of being in the room with people and, and producing and conducting that way, like, um, that is a little difficult because it kind of stretches the time sometimes. And it all depends on who you're working with and what their skill level is or, or comfort level is with um, recording at home. Like some people, they've been doing it for a while and they just get it out to you like the next day. And then some people are kind of like struggling with how to do it or um, everybody has their own process. So it, it kind of, you know what I mean? Like it sort of, it makes the timeline very fluid in that way because you're kind of at the whim of everyone's individual um, comfort level and their process. So that, yeah. that's been kind of an interesting thing, especially having guest appearances. Yeah. Uh, um, so that's, that's a great segue into what I wanted to ask next, next um, is gear. So that's like a question I get the most is like, I want to work remotely with somebody or I want to um, like produce some like tracks that I'm going to put out on my own or contribute to somebody else's. Um, what are you guys, I know Brad, you kind of have a very unique situation because you're also an engineer, but um, Will, like what was, what is the minimum gear you've been able to like get together for your drums and what was like sort of that aha moment or piece of equipment that you were like, that's what I was missing to get my drums <laughs> to sound the way that I'm okay sending them off for Man, recording. Um, for me, it really has been less about gear, although I have, I have enough gear to record I'm, I'm mostly i'm doing all of this stuff with four mics on the drums or less okay um and it started out actually like a couple of years ago i thought that i wanted to get into this and um got an old used four channel interface that really didn't want to work with my new computer <laughs> no, <that's laughs> so <mine. laughs> it was like it was like every time i wanted to record i had to shut the whole thing down clear all the memory and then record and, and it, it was fine it was just it took a lot of battling technology um but so i've got some new stuff recently that allows me mostly just to have a better workflow um can i can i ask what you i don't even know what you're using can i ask what you're using because it sounds using, great it's amazing i'm using a it's a um, focus right claret for pre um usb interface with nice. four mics and with, you're are they all like four drum mics like all like hooked on to the drums or how are you placing them so there i mean you can kind of see a little bit it it varying depending on the um song i'm doing i have a little bit of a different setup but oh cool i like that you have like, it all like i can see yeah, yeah. so you've so got, got that mic up top one overhead here and then i've got a uh you can't really see it very well oh yeah right I there see there's it. a snare drum mic um, at the moment, I have two mics on the bass drum. Mm -hmm. I have one inside and one on right on the front head. But a lot of the recordings are done with just one bass drum mic and then a pair 
um, a stereo pair of overhead mics. So you're not miking like every single drum? No. no. And um, uh, it's more important to capture the whole sound of the drum set and then start augmenting like the most important thing. So like if you just have one mic, put it over the drums and then, you know, I like when I first started doing this, I just spent hours taking a mic and being like, okay, what does it sound like over here? And what does it sound like over here? Um, and then you like add a bass drum mic and then it's like, okay, now where do you put that to have it sound the best? And then as you start adding more and more mics, that process becomes a year's worth of study, <laughs> as Brad <laughs> knows. <laughs> yeah, so um, Brad, what do you think as an engineer like uh, of his approach? Like for you, it's obviously working well um, enough that you guys are able to build on top of these recordings and they're clean enough. Um, so, mm -hmm. is, and also is, Will, are you sending him all four isolated mics and he's mixing them together or are you mixing it? He's, he's mixing it. Oh, okay, so all the raw pieces get sent to Brad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's got um, a lot more skill in that than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, that, that was the thing I was amazed by with the tracks is that I think um, it's, it's proof positive that you can, um, you know, with some time investment in, in placing the mics and figuring out where it is, um, you can get a great home or garage recording sound. It's just a matter of like doing the homework to like, Make sure your space sounds good with the reflections. And then, uh, you know, I should also mention that Will's drum kit and his drumming are a huge part of his sound and why it sounds so good. I did a record with him, uh, Adam Williams' band, a while back. And the thing I was amazed by was, like, I didn't really have to do much to your drums, like, at all, unless we were going for an affected sound or something. You know, I, um, it all depended, but but for the most part, it was, like, a little compression on the overall kit and some little things here and there. But for the most part, you know, the sound going in is incredible just of the drums themselves. So that's a huge part of it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that especially for the style of music we're doing, which is like kind of live jazz vibe, the four mic setup is perfect. It's simple. It gets a broad picture of the kit. You know, he's got the two overheads. Um, kick and snare so you you have everything you need right there um and it sounds incredible could, just on that focus if right. you could add one thing to will set up what would you add um i would add another will so he could double drum with himself <laughs> <laughs> okay within the realm of what we can do today if you were like will if you did this one thing or bought this one piece of equipment it would up your game what would that piece be oh gosh um the only, I mean, the only thing that I think, uh, you know, could improve upon it is maybe getting some sort of uh, um, outboard compressor or something to go through. But I'll, I'll just go ahead and say even that's not really necessary because, uh, you know, other engineers might want to strangle me for this, but um, the software is so incredible now. The, the emulation software, like, you can make things sound like tape. You can make things sound like they're coming through a 1970s era board um there the software and the the technology is really impressive and it's a lot of it's very affordable yeah. um you I, I should uh i should, the caveat to that is that there is something about true analog gear like the real studio real mics the real space that you cannot duplicate it'll just always sound like a studio but that does not mean that you can't get great recordings with, you know, pretty simple equipment and software that's out there. Yeah. So, uh, Will, are you recording into uh, software or like, what are you using on that end? Yeah. So I'm just, I'm recording into Logic and. And they're I doing mean, like a free 90 day trial, I think right now. Oh, uh, it was possible. Is, yeah. I think I, they I launched that. for a long time. <laughs> You're like, um, well, I paid for it. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I think long, it's long a, a 90 day trial in logic. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. um, that they launched as like a response to the pandemic. Um, so that mm. people can mm -hmm. try to do some home yeah. recording. Yeah. And if you don't want to pay for logic, GarageBand actually is a pretty great option. If you're just doing some basic recording, like, you don't have any of like the bells and whistles and, and plugins and that sort of stuff, but like 
I, I did some stuff for a friend recording with GarageBand on my phone. And it sounds, I mean, it sounds like drums recorded through a phone, but it's cool. It's like it has a, a sound. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, because if you're sending it raw to somebody to be mixed, um, Brad, would you say that it really matters if you use Logic or GarageBand? Is the file going to be the same? Like if you're not putting any effects or it's just like a raw, here it comes from the mic, um, is GarageBand reasonable for that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the end result is going to, you know, you can pop it out as whatever you like, if it's a WAV file or a um, AIFF, the, there's different formats, but um, the only difference with those is going to be the audio converters. And oh. this is going to get into real nerd stuff, but um, Let's hear it. <laughs> so that, I mean, the, the audio conversion, people will argue that certain audio converters are better than others. For instance, they'll say that the Pro Tools converters, which we have at the studio, are better or worse than the, um, you know, uh, other converters out there. Um, I suppose that's all debatable. I would always go for a higher end, like if you had, you know, a focus right interface or something like that, that's going to help with those, that aspect. But that being said, yeah, if GarageBand is what you have, just do it, man. I mean, it's, you know, it's um, right now, especially, I, I feel like we were already in sort of the wild west of recording. And now we're like back to the stone age of recording <laughs> because it's like, it's like anything goes. Like if you can make it sound good, make it sound good. It doesn't matter if you had to do it through a tin can or whatever, like just do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think with all of that, like the most important thing going back to what you were talking about is like getting a good sound on your instrument and playing something that you think is worth other people hearing. Like if yeah. you, no matter how, what your recording setup is, like if you, have an instrument that you can get a sound that you want out of it and say something with that that's going to like that's going to carry something over any amount of gear you can buy for sure and and there's also the aspect of um you know beyond gear the i think that the value that studios and engineers and mixers and people like that have is that they they have years and a wealth of experience that um is still worth, even if you record some tracks at home, I would say, unless you're feeling really good about your, your mixes or, or, you know, you you know where that's at, like it's worth sending it to somebody. It's worth finding someone that does have access to a studio with like top level converters and they can run it through some real analog gear. Because even if you take those home recordings and then you run it through a board and you run it through something, that's gonna help it um, reach that level that you want so you know i don't want to say like we don't need studios anymore everybody <laughs> <laughs> you know no yeah but, yeah um but i think there's a lot of things you can do and you can get to a certain level for sure with home recording style gear and then if you really want to like bump it up and have it be a little more rich and full and maybe have somebody else's ear to mix and produce it or whatever that's worth doing as well if you have the the the, the means to do so. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Brad, for vocals and guitars, um, would you recommend like for guitars just going straight into the um, interface versus like putting a mic to it, or do you find that it's tends to be better sound if you mic the guitar, if you you know if you can um, put your guitar in? It all. It, again, it all depends on what you're going for and what you have available. You know, if you have a, a great sounding amp and a decent mic, I'd say mic the amp for sure, because that's pretty much always going to sound better. Um, an interesting thing that I was finding out was a lot of the Motown recordings and classic, like I believe some of the meter stuff, they just went DI direct into the board with the guitars. There was no amp. They just went right in and then they would um, saturate the pre again this is nerd stuff we're getting into but they would saturate the preamp so they would like crank up the gain and that's how they got that kind of squonky nasty motown squonkity funk sound um so, so maybe again, experimenting with that like like compare play the same thing mic'd as you do going straight in and kind of see what yeah you know it's ex experiment with it because you're going to get different sounds one 
one is neither better nor worse. It's just a matter of taste. It's like saying like, uh, you know, it's like saying salt is better than sugar. Well, I, I suppose they're different things. You know what I mean? Yeah, so um, I had a, qu a question from Alex that I want to go back and ask, and it's specifically for you, Brad. Um, she asked, can you can Bradley speak to input levels on the tracks? I have a garage band and a focus right, and I'm doing vocals. I end up singing with some reverb preset on because I need it for my performance, but I realize if they take the effect off later and mix the levels, the levels may not be loud enough. Would, does, so basically I think the question is, if she's putting that pre, the reverb on it while she's recording and then you take the reverb off of that file later, is it, yeah. does it change things for the engineer or the person who's receiving those? Or is that a level is gonna be the same regardless? Um, well, you probably wanna check your levels dry first and foremost, like check them dry and just make sure you're not clipping anything. Um, you know, that's, that's a big thing is making sure you're not clipping the preamp, like your input that you're going into. And then also that you're not clipping the digital output of the master. Um, so you know, so you just make sure, what, what's that? For her case, like in checking both on the focus, right. And then checking that it's also yeah. garage band. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, in garage band and on the focus, right. Um, so you can, you know, and sing, sing as loud as you're going to get and make sure that it's not clipping. Once you have that, then whether or not you add reverb, um, it's gonna change the output level because you're, you're adding something else. So it's gonna change your volume, but then you can adjust it and um, uh, it won't really matter whether or not you have the reverb on because you have that dry level set. So, you know, that, that's probably the place to start. And then you can start adding all the fancy reverb and echoes and things. Yeah. Um, yeah. On, on reverb, do you have a favorite um, plugin that you use for reverb? Um, Nina Nelson is asking. Um, What's your fave, Brad? My fave? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I, 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 I move around quite a bit. Like, I'm not very loyal to any one particular thing. A lot of the, you know, we happen to have, and I happen to have at home, the Waves set of plugins that I just use. It's super cheesy. Everybody's like, Waves, whatever, man. But um, I, I love the, the Renaissance verb in Waves. Um, I also use the, there's an IR, um, it's an impulse response reverb that, that basically they've taken actual rooms and recorded the sound of them and then put them into this program that recreates that. Wow. Um, wow. I'll use that quite a bit, which is cool. Um, everybody talks about, I got to get it, the Valhalla reverb. Um, everybody swears by that. So I would say Those are I that's when I need reverb. <laughs> yeah, but that's when I, I need seen to try. that. <laughs> You've seen that one? I've seen it pop up on computer screens and be like, oh yeah, he's using that one again. Yeah, it's like the red Valhalla. Yeah, yeah. It's like a vintage one. Um, do you have any you use, Will? Are you... I use the Logix like standard plugins. I have not yeah. like spent any money on plugins yet. Um, Which actually are epic. I hear. I, I'm not a Logic guy, but I hear they're fantastic. I mean, but... given that I don't really know what I'm doing mixing drums, they do some stuff that I think sounds cool. Um, but <laughs> they definitely like definitely their reverbs sound very digital. Like you can hear that it's a, a, like a digital, re I don't know how exactly how to describe, but they sound very like computer created. Um, yeah. I have yet to try it, but I've heard of people creating reverb by like taping a, a 57 to the end of a, a, a hose, like a garden hose mm -hmm. and like wrapping it like around the drums five or six times. You have this coil of hose around your drums and you play and that will create this weird reverb effect but i haven't tried it yet oh we should try that next time <laughs> <laughs> nice um, awesome. um okay so back to my other question about mike so for um vocals what's a recommendation of like a mid-level mic that is going to be totally solid for home recordings of vocals um for most cases um, i know like if you have particulars that you like, you know, like certain things about mics, of course, but if, you, if you're like, this is my first time home recording, I've got a couple hundred dollars, um, what would you recommend somebody grab for vocals? Um, you know, it, 
it, once again, it depends on kind of what you're going for. Like, like if you're a really um, soft, if you're going for like super soft singer songwriter stuff where you want to like capture the air and you want it to be like really subtle and like, like uh, Elliot Smith stuff where you're like whispery, um, you know, you, you'd probably want to go with a large diaphragm condenser and you know there's a, i think it's a company called S S E. they make a lot of really good mics that are they're they're built off of some of the old classics like the um the old telefunken mics and u47s and things like that which are like they're the mics that you see in all the the vintage pictures of like you know johnny cash singing or or uh you know dolly parton or anybody like that is they're they're singing into those classic mics, which are, you know, they're like $10,000 or something, $15,000, not something that, you know, uh, a lot of people can, can afford. So uh, companies like SE and I think um, Manly makes a couple of uh, microphones like this. There's a lot of companies that are making, um, they're basically like remakes of those old mics and they're, they're really incredible. They're, they're very good. So I would look into one of those because they're at a much more affordable price point and um, you know, you can really get good sounds out of them. The only thing I would recommend against, and this is just cause I haven't used any that are amazing are USB mics, at least for it's recording like, vocals. Like something like this would not be good for like recording vocals. I mean, you, you could, again, I, there's no rules because somebody, you know what I mean? Like, like somebody uh, like, uh, Adele or something could could sing into that. Somebody like Beyonce could sing into well, that. Well, I'm like, saying oh your my average, god, that's amazing. <laughs> I'm saying your average musician who's just trying to get some decent home recordings. This is like I don't want. I want to say this was like fifty dollars or something on Amazon um, years ago. But you know, if you're gonna spend a couple hundred dollars, like get something decent, yeah. that's not made like. That's not like made for like, like uh, just like consumer use, but like go for like a pro level. A couple of things yeah. people have mentioned is um, Alex said she loves her EVND76. Have mm -hmm. you heard of that one? Yeah, Electro Voice makes really good stuff. And I then an NT, and then Michael Hoggard said, love my NT1. Yeah, Rode. Rode makes the NT1, which is kind of like a remake of the, I think it's the U87 classic mic it's like a longer silver large diaphragm that's a that's a great mic the nt1 for sure um, those are um like price wise do you think those are like maybe mid or high or kind of where i mean you may not i, I know my I haven't how, why would you know the price but <laughs> i haven't looked at the prices in a while but you know i think for that level of mic you're probably talking it, it's i'm i think they're under a grand for sure maybe even in the like Four or five hundred range somewhere. Oh, okay. like, I think to get a, to get a decent recording mic for vocals that in that realm, you're going to want to go like three to five hundred at least. Now that being said, um, again, depending on don't what say kind of it. music, don't say it. What? <laughs> you're Adele. You're going to sound good on a <laughs> no, 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 shitty I, blue I mic. Go back there, but <laughs> it depends on what kind of music you're recording because my all one of my all time favorite mics for vocals is the SM7B which is basically like, it's essentially like a 58, which is the mic you always see at shows. It's the PA mic, it's like the standard. Um, you know. yeah, that's what, I have one of those, yeah. That's not a 58, but it looks like that. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a great mic and they cost like a hundred bucks. The 7B is a little more, it's like 300, but like you like can the record new, great vocals. The 7, SM7B is 399? Yeah, 399. And that's like, that's my desert island mic. I would use that for all kinds of stuff. That's a good, um, I, that's the question I should have asked. What's your desert island vocal mic for home? SM7B, for sure. We're kind, of, <laughs> we're kind of in a desert island situation. Like this is the time that you get your desert island things. <laughs> yeah, and and I will say that Will, I think, did you have, you have the C1000s on your overheads, right? Yeah. Those are uh, great, man. Yeah, I got those from David Salonen. <laughs> oh. Who, by the way, is like my hero. <laughs> that guy is like one of the, one of the, if not the best engineer in town. Like he's, I need to have he's him on just here. amazing. He's yeah, great. He's awesome. Live 
especially for live stuff, he's just outstanding, man. Yeah, he's been doing like the Nectar live streams, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those sound great. They sound so good. VE's yeah, performance he, on there is amazing. Yeah, really incredible. He's going to do big things, that, that David Salonen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's already doing it, so it's great. Yeah. Um, are there any, like, for home recording and collaboration, is there any, like, aha moment stuff that you guys have experienced where you were like, that's the game changer for me or made it kind of click? Um, Brad, you mentioned that utilizing, like, even if you're making all your own pieces like recording all your own things hiring an engineer to actually mix and then sending it off to mastering that was one of those things you recommended is there anything else that you can think of that people should be considering um, when they're trying to collaborate from a distance this way um probably be patient <laughs> i don't know like like will's been very patient with me i like i was super <laughs> amped at first and just like yeah let's do this and then like life comes in and other things happen and so we had some stuff sit around for a while and I commend his patience with me because, uh, you know, it was, uh, sometimes it takes a while to, to pull these things together. Yeah. Um, and as far as, yeah, recommendations, I mean, always, if you can, if you have the, the ability or the budget or the connections to up your production value, then absolutely by all means do that. And when you do that, you're going to be spreading the love and employing your fellow musicians and artists and creatives. So that's always a good thing. Um, but it's not always the end of the world if you're unable to do that. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't put something out. Like just, I'm, I'm just at a point in my life, particularly <laughs> where I'm like, just do it. Just do it. You know, yeah. it's like Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> just do it. Uh I think for me, and most of my audio recording has come in conjunction with video, which is a little different because I know like, um, I took some coaching lessons from Ed Brooks about thinking about audio with my video. And, you know, he was explaining that like our eyes fill in a lot of the blanks when you're doing a video audio. So it's a much simpler process than like trying to put something together that's just for one sense, which is your, your ears. Um, mm. But for me, it was getting a interface. And I tried, like, I had I read the same situation you had, Will, where I borrowed an interface from Brad, but my computer was too new for this interface. And I had, like, two or three of those I borrowed from people. <laughs> no, That's the other thing. I'm is so like, sorry. It was too old for your computer. <laughs> the thing is, it wasn't even that old. It was, like, a five-year-old interface. So, you know, it's not like you gave me something from, like, the 90s. Like, it's... <laughs> yeah. It goes, like, uh, it, it goes fast. It goes so quick. Um <laughs> But it was getting an interface and not going directly into the camera or directly into the computer, but running through um, the interface because the computer and the camera compress everything down. And so it becomes really like tiny, you know, and, and there's not much to it. So I think that was sort of my aha thing was that I needed some type of interface and not even like a fancy one. Um, I borrowed, I ended up borrowing one from Matt Teske that he uses for live sound. Um, and I ended up buying the same one because I host shows here at my house. And I'm like, oh, well, this will work for both my audio, for videos and for this. And it was like a game changer. Just being able to control like the vocal to guitar, like when they're being recorded together, like just a little tiny bit of control that you get from using the interface and then it not compressing, game changer. Yeah, <laughs> that was my aha, which sounds like really obvious if you're a, like an experienced musician. But if you're new to all of this, like I don't think people realize like that's that was great. And I just used mics I had that were like live mics, like for shows because I have a small PA. So it's my first level of mics weren't even that great, but it sounded better just because it came through that interface. So it was yeah. it was the um, upgrade I had to make. What about yeah. you, Will? Was there something in home recording that clicked for you that really made it easier? Um, I think a lot of it was just that it takes way longer than you think it's going to. And, <laughs> and just like, like kind of like Brad said, like learning, learning to be patient. And like, if I'm going for a sound and I'm not like if I'm recording something and I'm not happy with the way it sounds, it's not gonna get fixed later. Like if I don't think it sounds good, 
going in there like there's a lot of wizardry that um, a great engineer can do but for me to really feel inspired and especially in the process of like sending stuff back and forth like take the time to get something sounding the way you want to when you record it and I think that that really it took me a long time of like oh well yeah that's great I'll just put it up and and put something out and and um the things that I end up being happy with are when I like spend a couple hours really like moving stuff around and comparing stuff um but then I don't know on the flip side like I can do that until I go insane and then somebody's like well it sounds great Whatever you yeah. did, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, so maybe just kind of what I'm hearing is maybe stay away from situations where you would like in the studio, you might be like, let's just punch in here or take part of this song and that song, but try to make it so it's like more of a performance. Is that kind of what you're saying? Like, especially with the delay, like sending things back and forth. Like if you get into that, like, I want to change this one part. I'm going to redo this one riff. Like, you know, it's just going to mm -hmm. get like, it's not the same as in the studio where you're like, all right, I'm going to come back tomorrow and just lay that again. Like, yeah. You, yeah, it'll it'll put it could put days or weeks or more on getting it done. So, mm -hmm. but I, I agree with Will. Like it's you know, it's kind of like finding a nice middle ground, a balance between those things. Like not being too perfectionist, but also not being too lazy about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I think about there's this record I love that came out for I was a teenager and it came out by this band Battle Flags, and he did all of it in his home like studio in his basement with like, it's so lo-fi, but it's such an like iconic record for me. And he has like redone all of those songs like in a studio setting, but I never listened to that one. I always listened to the, like the early recordings that were up that I don't even think he has them on Spotify anymore. You have to like go to YouTube and listen to them. Like, so there's something, <clears throat> there's something about that like lo-fi, sound that's going to be iconic to this time period i think like mm -hmm. recordings that are coming out in this pandemic i think are going to have that texture to it that are going to kind of date it i mean maybe i'm mm -hmm. just being too like woo woo but it feels like it's going to give it a sound like the home recording sound is going to be part of this period in time yeah basically. Mm -hmm. yeah i i agree and and i think it is um it's important, I think, for, for a lot of us as artists and, and musicians to kind of capture that and, you know, run that through our filter and create things now and be immediate about it because it is so, everything is so visceral and, and heavy and uh, beautiful at the same time. So it's all just, you know, capturing that in the moment, I think, is really, um, it feels uh, important to do something right now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so maybe like try not to get like an engineer hat on, you know, like, yeah. try, try not to put that hat on and get to like, I have to have these mics and this equipment and it has to be recorded perfectly and, and mm -hmm. try to keep your artist hat on while you're like trying to figure out the technical side, yeah. kind of what I'm yeah. hearing. Um, so we had another question. Um, it's, do you record bass direct? Um, do you mic? um combination and if you <clears throat> and then it says if combined what mic so do you have a brad do you have a recommendation about recording bass um, um personally i prefer to record bass di um as long as you have a good preamp and you know you can even throw it through some i'll throw it through plugins like i have the cla chris lord algae bass plugins that are really cool i also use sans amp which is another plugin and you can kind of manipulate all sounds put distortion and crunch on it and more often than not that works really well for me and it's fast because the more elements you put in like if you if you're recording through an amp then you have to like get the amp at the right level and you got to get the mic all together and so again it comes down to like you can spend the time doing that if the amp is really important to the sound that you're going for because it can be but for me personally more often than not i end up using the di signal for 80 percent of things that i do just because you just get like a nice even uh cutting bass tone and then you know you can usually add more low end if you need to um yeah so that's what i do and since we're on this train what about keys you're going right in from the keys 
Uh, again, it depends on what you have and your capabilities. Most people in their home situation, they're just going to go direct in maybe off a keyboard or a Nord or something that, you know, there's lots of keyboards that have great built-in sounds, um, which you again can always run through plugins or you can, um, I've, I've run things like DI, like a, a keyboard DI, and then also run it through like a little amp so I can get more of a crunchy real sound and then I'll blend those together. So, um, you know, it's funny, there's no rules. It's basically like try what you can. With, with keys, usually the best bet is to go DI because you'll get the cleanest sound and then from there, manipulate it. Are there any instruments I'm missing that have any like uh, trick to them? <laughs> sitar. <laughs> no, I, okay. I think Skylar Mihal might be the only person I know that can play a sitar, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think he just got one. <laughs> Yeah, he's the only person I know that has one or can play one that yeah. I'm aware of um, in Seattle. So they're but, difficult. <laughs> they look difficult. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, well, are there any, do you have any parting wisdom about home recording and the process of collaborating um, from a distance? Will? Um, just do it. I think that's <laughs> the, 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 the hardest, the hardest part is to start. Um, the hardest part is to like in isolation come up with something and be like i think this is cool give it to somebody else uh so just for me it was just forcing myself to do something every day it was like every day i had to sit down and create something and i put them all online and most of them i still don't like but they're up there and maybe somebody is inspired by it so i think the most important thing is to um, do it and do it consistently and go back and check on yourself every once in a while and see what you're doing and if it's still inspiring and hopefully you'll see as you do it that um, there's some arc of progress. You're more comfortable, you're making things that are more interesting to you or to other people, um, but just do it. Yeah. What about you, Brad? Um I would just, I'd second that sentiment, <laughs> do it. Um, that's, you know, that's something I've struggled with myself for a long time. Um, you know, I, I've got a lot of, you know, material kind of like waiting in the wings and things that uh, I've been overly perfectionist about or just waiting on or thinking, ah, oh, it's not good enough. It's not this, it's not that. Um, but I think that is the beauty of what we're doing in this collaboration with Couch Cats is that we've kind of put that aside and we've, we've spent enough time to, you know, make it sound at least good enough so that we like it and we dig it and we think it's cool. And um, so that, that's really satisfying at this point just to do it. And also beyond that, like the fact that we're opening it up to uh, having guests come in, um, has been really cool too because we're, we're remote collaborating with people that we haven't gotten to play with yet but we know them in the scene um people like uh cole schuster uh he he wrote uh, an awesome guitar part to one of will's beats and so he sent that in and we're, we're building something off that along with um evan captain on keys who's an amazing uh keyboard player and a bunch of other friends that we've invited in and so slowly as we piece together these songs we're gonna have just people in the community jumping in and, um, you know, hopefully we can make it into something that's not only satisfying for the musicians to collaborate on, but for people to listen to and groove to and, you know, um, you know, hopefully even support the musicians because all, all, all the proceeds are going to go directly to the musicians um, helping them out. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, just a matter of doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna third your guys's and just say that <laughs> when it comes to you know most independent musicians like we're working with communities that are supportive and like loving of what you're doing so putting something out there that maybe isn't completely the most highly produced thing you've ever done like the risk is really low for rejection like they would rather hear from you in a more lo-fi setting than not hear from you at all I think you know yeah. from my marketing um and just like as a fan like hearing from my favorite artists in a lo-fi setting is definitely way better than not hearing them from, hearing from them at all and waiting till I don't know when to be able to hear something that they're working on 
um, or is complete and ready to be like released, especially that's going to speak to the moment that we're in, um, in a year, because we all know how it takes a really long time to like get in the studio and make something. So, um, I think that it's, yeah, it's just like getting started. It's going to be the scariest part. Um, mm -hmm. and I want to encourage people who are brand new to this to reach out to you guys at Couch Cats about collaborating. I'd love to see and encourage women and people of color to join this collaboration. It's a really safe space. Um, jump right in, you know, it's, it's gonna be fun. Like, I'm not really much of a musician, but it makes me wanna be like, I can contribute something, like. <laughs> yeah, it's for yeah. everybody, everybody jump in. Yeah, you know? I think that's cool. And I, I think it's awesome that you're creating that space for people to experiment. Maybe they're not comfortable doing it on their own or doing it with their own band. And finding things like this or starting something like this, if you guys, if you're in from another community that you don't wanna join this one, like, like start something up like this as a safe space to experiment because we're all learning. We're all trying to figure out how to navigate the pandemic and navigate how we continue to create music and participate with our fans. So yeah, I think it's, I love this idea of like remote collaboration completely from scratch. Like it's not just about getting your own band online, but like networking, meeting new people, you know, it's, it's pretty neat. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm just gonna check for questions before we sign off. Um, yeah, it looks like everybody's agreeing that we just all need to do it. Great. <laughs> all I right. Look forward to hundreds of emails flooding for couch our inboxes. Cats. <laughs> um, I have like 300 followers on Kinsey. Like, I don't think this is gonna be a viral video, but I think I mean... that's more than we have. What I <laughs> no, if when somebody I, I wants first... to participate, how do they do that? Where do they find Couch Cats? Um, we are on Instagram at Couch Cats. At Couch Cats. I can't um, believe that was available. It, yeah, right. It, I it think just it just. Up there. Brad, I think you just saw a picture of me sitting with my cats, and we're like, "There's that's that's the title of the, the band <laughs> right there." We're all recording from our couches yep. anyway, so it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't. Yeah, that's what we used for the cover. Was a picture that Will had of, and it's like it's funny because it's his cats, and like one of them's on the ground, and the other one's like up in this like sort of is it a crib or something or <laughs> no there's there's like a railing of coming oh. up of, of um up from my front door and so oh, there's it's like, like yeah. a railing and he's like behind the railing yeah, and they're like yeah. looking at each other and they're so far away and they're like hey what's up man what's up and so <laughs> it, it had i don't know it just had the vibe and i was like oh it's kind of like i don't even know where it popped up from but it, it was kind of like cats is a term used in the sort of you know uh jazz and, and funk world of like you know cats playing things like you know uh she's a cool cat he's a cool cat that whole thing and so we took that and then uh everybody's on the couch right now <laughs> so it's i guess that's what it is um so it's instagram and then to collaborate do you guys have an email address someone should send it to or just hit you up on instagram and you guys can coordinate from there is that the best thing yeah, um, I'd say the, the easiest way is to just DM us on, on uh, Insta yeah. and follow us and, and all that yeah. fun stuff. That's going to be our main hub for the time being. We're keeping it simple. Cool. I'm going to yeah. go recruit some great players I know and be like, come do this project. It's going to be fun. So Awesome. Cool. <laughs> cool. We well, appreciate thanks. it. Thanks so much for your time, guys. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. If you guys have more questions, put them in the comments. I'll be around to find the answers um, for you if I don't have it. Um, and tune in this weekend on Sunday. I'm going to be having a similar chat with Ed Brooks. We're going to talk about mastering and engineering and his career. He's had such a cool and amazing career. Um, mm -hmm. As well as like what the 90, you know, 90s and early 2000s scene was like in Seattle. I've been here for